All right, this is chapter 10. Now we're talking about some of the protection mechanisms. This chapter, I would say, is a little bit more interesting than all the policies, if I can get it to advance here, okay? All right, we're going to talk about some of the different controls, some of the different mechanisms, and we've talked about some of them already, but we're just going to cover them a little more in depth, okay? The sphere of security. There's a couple things on here that are kind of cool to look at. How about redundancy? That's an area where a lot of people don't have... I mean, you might have two firewalls, might have redundant servers. So there's a lot of stuff that's kind of important. But you know, do you actually have all of these in place? Does everybody do patches and upgrades? You know, you said it was the, the Tuesday patches yesterday came out. Did you guys already implement them all? The critical ones within 24 hours. Okay. So you did it or somebody else at your organization did it? Well, no, someone in my work. Okay. They don't let me test. Are you sure they did it? But they probably have some kind of patch management system, right? What's that? They probably have a patch management system. Right, they probably have SUS or yeah, something. They use, yeah, they use big things. But no, there's someone Maybe. in our organization that's tasked to do okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Now, okay, but that also brings up the question, okay, is it one person that's tasked to do it? They're each his backup. Okay, and one of them, one of them had a doctor's appointment and the other one's on vacation this week. Right. I'm just giving you scenarios what could happen. Yeah. So well, the problem is if they miss their service level agreement, then I take money out of their contract. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So they might do it then. They, yes, they might. They probably have. They probably did it within 20 minutes. And I have a, we have a dashboard that shows if they met their SLA. Yeah. Now, um, with your systems, do they actually install the fix on production systems? Do they install it on test systems first and then production? We have a test, system, we have some, a test environment that they test it on first. Okay. And they good. have 100 workstations throughout the facility that's the pilot group. Right. And then they go system-wide. So with these critical updates, that they actually do that with every time they do? Everyone. That's awesome. I mean, that I, when I ran my business, I even told some of my clients, I don't always install all updates. Now, critical, I like to do. Right. But other ones, people are like, oh, my God, there's an update. I says, but do, what does the update do? Like a, a prime example was there was an update once for a CD-ROM driver. Yeah. And they're like, why didn't you install the update? I'm like, we don't use a CD-ROM. Why risk it? Right. What, what they do is she actually rates the uh, risk uh, based on the impact of the system, what okay. the impact would be, are we susceptible, and if a critical update is also susceptible to our system, right. then it gets the 24-hour cycle. If uh -huh. it's not very susceptible, like it's just intermittent, then they've right. got like seven days to do it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Way back when I uh, switched to uh, Server 2003, um, I hosted a bunch of websites. I hosted, uh, you know, y'all know who Bart Connors is, the, the gymnast, gold medal gymnast. Well, I used to host all his websites. He had internationalintelgymnast.com. I hosted all his stuff. And I, I hosted a bunch of other websites. Um, and I had an issue. When the issue, when, when Server 2003 came out, his website quit functioning correctly. And what he does, or at least he did, I don't know if he still does today, but whenever there was a gymnast event in the world, he would send somebody to it. And they would, kind of like a blog, but they would actually be updating the web page. So-and-so just tripped. So-and-so just scored a five, whatever. They'd be updating this pretty quickly on the website, real time. Well, the weird thing was when I switched to server 2003, updates weren't taking effect for five minutes. So he'd be logging in from all over the world, updating the web page, yet you couldn't see it. And about five minutes later, the updates would appear. It was the weirdest thing. So he'd be calling me and he's like, why aren't these updates happening? Well, um, came out, uh, I ended up calling Microsoft for it. Microsoft remotely got into my system. And they were in my system for months, literally months, trying to fix this problem. Because they could see it. And they literally could see it happening, but they could not figure out why it was happening. They didn't know how to fix it or anything about it. So they were, you know, they tried all kinds of stuff. So they contacted me and said, all right, Ken, we're going to put this update on. It didn't fix They kept doing all these changes. They couldn't fix it. Finally, months later, they said, okay, there's one more thing we're going to check. And sure enough, it fixed it. What they ended up doing was they ended up making a hot fix just for me, which is a, a fix specifically designed for Ken Dewey's system that they will most likely add to updates later on and put in service packs. Well, the error was... If you know anything about IIS configuration, you can do IP or, you know, numbered-based hosting or name-based hosting. You could have a website linked to a number or, you know, one website to one number. Or you could actually have multiple websites linked to the same number, and then it goes by name. Okay? 
I had both implemented. And Microsoft's like, we didn't expect anyone to do it that way. And the problem was, whenever you implement both, it disabled, or it actually enabled the caching of the website, so the, immediate, uh, the updates weren't done Im immediately. But it was funny, they're like, we didn't expect you to do it that way. I said, but you have it available. But no one does it that way. Obviously, somebody does. <laughs> so uh, they were able to fix it, but it literally took months. And I thought Bart Connors was getting upset. He's like, I can't, because I, when I first started hosting his stuff, I really didn't know what he did. I knew he was a gymnast. I knew he went to events. But when it was a live event, he would literally have someone go there. Then all of a sudden, my traffic would go from 100 hits a day to 10,000 in a minute. I mean, you can look at my law. It's like, what the hell is going on? It's because he would say, okay, starting at 3 p.m. Central, this event's going on in Germany. And everybody would be going to the webpage and didn't refresh. You know, to see the updates. And when they couldn't get updates for five minutes, they were freaking out. Like, oh, my God, what happened? So, but, uh, but that, you know, so patches and updates is a, is a very tough business to get into. All right. Um, firewalls, we talked about. Actually, we can talk more about those now. But those are important. Proxy servers, encryption. There's a lot of stuff that's involved in the technology area. Now, in the people area, we have planning. We have education. We talked about all that. Policies and laws. So... Kind of a cool picture. It does talk about a lot of it. Okay. So identification is obtaining identity of the person requesting access to a physical area. When you ask for someone, uh, I, I'm assuming we all have faculty ID cards here, and student ID cards and all that stuff. Okay. So does IT, I mean, you, you have one on your belt, I think I saw it. You have an ID card showing you work for IT. Yeah, it doesn't say IT. Oh, it doesn't? Yeah, it's just a standard. Ah. ICC. See, we, our IT people now have to wear a whatever, a lanyard where they badge identifying them as IT. Yeah, which is actually a good idea. Because, you know, if I'm a faculty here and you walk in, I don't have a clue who you are, whoa, whoa why are you touching my system? You know, so it's actually a good thing we implemented. So but identification's a big deal. Um, authentication, how are they getting in authorization? We're going to talk about more of these in depth in this chapter, actually. So, all right. And authorization, what can they do once they get in? Okay. Then accountability, what did they do? We're going to document it. We're going to keep track of what they did. We're going to keep our logs going, stuff like that. Uh, and the CESL approach does all four. Okay. So let's talk about identification a little more in depth. Okay. It could be a label applied to a person or to an object. It could be to anything. Okay. Must be unique. You should not have two with the same. That's why we're changing the logins for the vSphere system because we we're worried about two John Smiths. So we're actually adding the .ms, whatever, MCC at the end. Okay. Must be unique, must be mapped one-to-one. -one. Okay. Authentication could be something you know, something you have, something you are, something you produce. Okay. And strong means you have to have more than one. You should never have just one authentication. You need at least multi-factor authentication. Okay. Something you know, it could be a password, a passphrase. So what, what makes up a good password? What do you think? Okay, least eight characters, okay. Uh, probably combination of uppercase, lowercase numbers, and special characters. Okay. But what happens when we make them too difficult? <laughs> People write them down, or it gets to the point where they have to reset them all the time. So there's a definite trade-off, okay. So it says the password is a private word, a combination of characters that only the user knows, Okay. A passphrase, on the other hand, is a plain language phrase, typically longer than a password. I have some, like my vSphere login is a very long phrase. I type it in, like a sentence. And it's actually a decent password that way. Okay? All right. So it should be at least eight characters long and contain the least numbers in one special character. So I said one of my systems is actually one of my banks that requires lowercase and numbers only. That is the craziest thing. But then, you know, it gets back to the ATMs I talked about. Our ATMs, which actually contain our money, is a four-digit PIN number, which is crazy as well. It's like, what the heck? All right. There we go. We've got passwords. Number with one character. The odds of cracking one in 68. If we get up to a 10 character, look how, how long it would take. Eight, four, nine, five years. 8,000 years to crack it. Wow. Now, case sensitive... Yeah, now we're up to 216,000 years to crack it. So, unless you have a supercomputer. 
Right, right unless you have a supercomputer. Have you ever looked like Red Storm or Roadrunner? Yeah. Have you ever looked at the breakdown for like 448 Blowfish encryption? Oh, it's crazy. You're never going to break it. You know, supercomputer <coughs> trying a, a billion or so many billion brute force attacks per second. Right. They take like eight. I mean, the, the, at the bottom of the list, there wasn't even a number that could yeah. describe how many years it would take. Yeah, um, it, it, it's crazy. Um, and we talk about that in my computer security class. You know, people complain like, oh, it's only 2048-bit encryption. So do you really know what 2048-bit you know, encryption is? That's a lot of stinking encryption. So, uh, You ever watch the, movie, the TV show 24 with Jack Bauer? Some of you had to watch that. I, I, I was funny. There was one, I think it was the last season where they're breaking into this building Oh, no, it's encrypted with blowfish. Oh, wait a minute. I know the back door for blowfish. I'm in. You know, it's like, yeah. I just, I see that stuff. It's like, okay. Yes, I know, I know. He's actually in a TV show that just ended called Touch. That wasn't bad. It was, it was pretty good. But, yeah. Have you ever watched the, any of the series Tiger King? No, I have. Wait a minute. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Yes, I have, yeah. That was really good. Yeah. There was also another, wait, no, maybe it was Tiger Team. There was one where they were hired to break into a car dealer. Okay, there was Tiger Team. It was amazing what they did. They actually got all the cars for all the Lamborghinis and drove them around and parked them backwards or something. I forget what they did. But. Yeah, so. Yes, the jewelry shop, yes. It's amazing, yeah. So if you ever get a chance to watch it, that's a good show, Tiger Team. Yeah, it's probably online somewhere you can watch it. Is, it's but. On, I mean, it's on YouTube. Okay, yeah, it's really, and it's just common sense stuff, what people do. It's just, I don't know, it's amazing. All right, um, one thing kind of like that, which I was actually impressed, it's Oklahoma City Airport. I've actually flown out of there a million times, I think. You know how when you get to the gates and they got that door to, you know, to go from the gate to the airplane? They've always had a little number pad there. But what I've noticed lately is they got it, and they always walk up now, and they, like, cover it with their body, and so you can't see what they're doing anymore. I was, I was very impressed. I'm like, wow, they're actually hiding it finally. Where you go other places, you can see what they're doing. The key lock you got on your door here. Um, I used to take care of a law firm downtown Oklahoma City, and the password was always three consecutive numbers. So it was either one, two, three, two, three, four, three, four, five, you know, four, five, one. 512, I mean, that's all it was. So how long did it take? It was always three consecutive numbers. Because they'd call me and say, the password's been changed, it's now 451. I'm like, oh, that was hard to figure out. <laughs> but it's, it just increments, so not a, not a good idea. One of those little keypads in the uh, Wichita airport, the, the numbers are worn off. Uh, oh, nice. Four. Yeah, that's how no change combination. This, wow. <laughs> No, they should be changing. Well, we talked about the A yesterday, how ours, they keep changing the combination, but they're not clearing out the old codes. It's like, what good is that? So, crazy. You should try that on one of your doors. See if the old codes work. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, I, I just, you know, it I'll could. Yeah, because they don't think about it. Because I, I get emails, just, we have changed the code on the doors. And finally, one day I went to the dean. I said, you do realize you're changing the code, but you're not erasing the old codes? He's like, what do you mean? It says every code you've ever put in there still works. It's like, oh, I never thought about that. I didn't think they knew how to clear them. They do now that I told them how, but it's, it's kind of funny. Okay, all right, something you have. Could be a car key, could be a token. Um, when I worked for that law firm, they were up on the 34th, 34th floor, and on weekends, the elevators wouldn't come past the second floor. But I had a smart card I put in my pocket, which was kind of handy. I just leave it in my wallet. I just put my butt up against the sensor and automatically work. That way you don't have to get the card out. But something you have could be a dumb card like an ATM. Could be a smart card. Uh, I'm retired military, so I have a military ID, and I still have the dumb ID. If you're active duty, you get the nice one with the smart card built yeah, into it. Card. It's not fair. They won't give me one. It's like, but nope, we don't give much retirees yet. I'm like, that sucks. But all right, could be a cryptographic token, kind of like what I showed you on my phone. Okay. It could be synchronous or asynchronous. It could be linked to something or not. Okay. Here is an RSA. You have a secure ID. Comes up with a code. You have to enter within so many seconds. Um, a movie called Robert Redford. Let me think. It's um, oh, sneakers. sneakers. 
excellent movie called Sneakers from Robert Redford. There's a deal on there where you have to enter a certain code in a certain amount of time. They were hired to break into stuff. Like they'd break into a bank and steal tons of money, then give it all back to them, get paid a couple hundred dollars. It's like, darn it. But it's a, yeah, it's kind of cool. So Sneakers is another good movie you should watch. All right. So something you are, inherit to you, could be biometrics. Okay, they scan your characteristics. Okay, could be whatever. Okay, and we're going to see more about that here in a minute. Okay, something you produce, or the user performs or produces, you could take a signature, you could enter something. The uh, military, you know, since I'm retired, whenever I go to Tinker Air Force Base Hospital, they always want to know if I have third party insurance. Because I have insurance at Rose State as well. So if I ever get sick, ever go to a doctor, they always want to bill them first. Whenever they don't pay, then the government insurance pays, which is fine. I don't mind that. So I have double insurance, so I don't ever have to pay any copay. But I always had to prove to them that I had that. And the proof up until just recently has always been a little yellow card with a date on it. You'd go to this place, you'd sign a paper saying, I do not have or I do have other insurance, and they give you a yellow card. It's all the proof they needed. But actually, about a month ago, they just finally switched it where I no longer need that yellow card. Because I kept asking them, I'm like, what securities in this yellow card it says well it proves that you went and updated your form i said no it doesn't it's just a card with a date on it i can, I mean, there's stacks of those cards i could literally take a piece of yellow construction paper type on it and put a date on it, and i'd be fine so they finally switched that all right here we go some some recognition we could have fingerprints we could have a hand geometry signature voice when i was in tulsa it was a student doing research on keyboard dynamics. Actually, I think I, had, I might even have a lab. For, at least I did have a lab. For, actually, let's see if it's in here. Hold on. I had it at one time. Let me find it. Um, let's go here. Oh, man, I don't have it in here anymore. Well, that sucks. All right, I had a lab. I don't know what I did with it. Let me see if I can't find it. Keyboard dynamics. Um, it's a company that provided it. News and rumors, encyclopedia. A book. No, that's not it. Oh, I can't. Darn it. I was Basically, what you do is you go to this website, and you type for a few hundred characters, and then it would actually use that to see if it was you. It was really, really awesome. I know I had it somewhere. Actually, let me go check Dropbox real quick. Maybe I have a different version. I know I had it up there, and you guys could see it. Let me pause this for a minute. All right. So, um, all right, to continue, um, we just walked through that little demo of keyboard recognition. But they got handwriting recognition. When I was in Tulsa, they had the girl walking around with a laptop, had this type of phrase in there, and she was actually doing keyboard dynamics to see how we typed and all that stuff. So it's kind of cool. Um, they have Irish recognition, retinal recognition. We bought a cheap, I say cheap, it was 400 bucks. A uh, iris scanner didn't work for nothing. Uh, I had uh, eye surgery, and I can never, I could never record, it would never basically, I could register my eye, but I could never get it to verify me again. You know how you could do it twice, like enter your password again? It would never do it. So some, it was just very, it sucked. They say the good ones cost thousands of dollars, though, Okay. They have signature recognition of facial geometry, and that's where I think a lot of it's going now is this whole facial geometry. Even Facebook has that built into it now. Google Plus does. They all start doing, hey, we think we found a picture of you, that kind of stuff. So it's kind of cool. There's a lot of it out there. Okay. In, uh, in Japan, yes. they actually have an operation at banks, when you go into banks, right. where uh, they shine a light, light through your hand, you put it up on there, yeah. and it's actually looking at the uh, design of your veins. Wow. And it's doing recognition by the, like, the, your veins, flow of your veins here. Oh, well, that's cool. And they actually are using it in veins. Hmm. That's cool. Um, I had a, uh, 
and again, this is a story I heard from someone else, but I had a lot of students from Tulsa go to the NSA to do their internships over the summer. And I guess is the trick they play on a lot of them. They have, um, I forget what you call it. There's a name for it. Uh, basically, you go into a, a small room, then you provide your authentication. If you match it, then you go through. There's a name for it. If oh, you, uh, we call it a man trap. Yeah, man trap. That's what it is. Okay. Basically, what they would do is you go into this man trap, and then you would provide your authentication. Then the door would open. You continue through. Through. If it, if you can't provide your authentication, the doors don't open. They call the cops on you. Right. They were saying that when you go start your internship at the NSA, a couple of days after you start, they send you out to get two gallons of orange juice. And the man trap actually checks your weight. And when you come back with the orange juice, your weight is not within so many whatevers of the previous weight. So it always captures them. And so. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, it's kind of funny, but there's a lot of stuff you can do with that. All right, types of authorization. We have um, we have authenticated users, people we know, people have been verified, okay? We could also be members of a group, you know, where you could be authorized that. You're, you're granted access based on that, kind of like our uh, cleaning crew. We hire the cleaning company, which then goes out and hires the people who are based on the fact that they are part of that group or that organization, Okay. You can also have authentication that goes across multiple systems. Um, they call it a centralized login. Like I log into my system at Rose State, my computer. And I can automatically access the file server and a bunch of other machines based on my domain membership. Okay. All right. Okay. Other stuff. They have false reject rates. Percentage of authorized users who were denied. You, know, you want to keep track of that. False acceptance rates, percentage of unauthorized who are allowed. So which one's more important, you think? False reject or false accept? So would it be worse to have more people... Well, you would want them accepted falsely. Right, I, I would not want the falsely accepted. Right, right. I would be okay with false rejects, but I would definitely not want to have a false acceptance. Right. If I, if I just randomly start accepting people, uh, it's like with spam. I used to do a lot of, you know, like I said, I ran my ISP. I had to work with spam. Well, I had companies that did not want any spam protection whatsoever. Uh, Chapel Supply sold pressure washers and stuff like that. Um, his reasoning was kind of weird. Well, he sold pressure washers. I mean, he had a website, which we actually made for him. Never sold anything on the website. But the website was there so you could see the products. You could buy it online, but no one ever did. But every single page had the 1-800 number, 1-800 number. But they could see what they got available, then you call the number to order it. But, but he had people from China ordering, people from all over the world ordering from him. And try filtering spam when you got people ordering from Amsterdam, Asia Pacific. It's tough. Because Asia Pacific, 99.9% .9 of the mail spam. So it's very hard to go with that. Uh, a funny story about him when he got into business. Um, had a jewelry store, Gordon's Jewelers. I don't know if you got, do you have Gordon's Jewelers up here? Okay. Big, big jewelry chain, Gordon Jewelers. They got in trouble for dumping their cleaning solution into the sewer system. Okay, you know, you ever get your rings cleaned at a jewelry store? Here, we'll clean your ring for free. Well, they would throw this stuff out. They got in trouble for that, for throwing it away. Big fine, you know. So they had to go out and buy a system to clean and filter the solution. Well, Chapel Supply was hired to install the system for them. I don't know what it cost, but it was quite expensive. Well, there was a, a byproduct of this. The byproduct was they were actually cleaning the solution and extracting the gold and silver out of it. So in the first year, they already extracted enough waste materials to pay for the entire cost of the cleaning system, which they were originally just dumping down the drain. So they didn't even realize they were dumping gold and silver down the drain because think about it. You get your ring cleaned, obviously little pieces of the metal are going to come off. So it was. So they ended up going out to other jewelry stores and saying, hey, look how much money. Here's what it costs, but look how much money you can save. So kind of a cool way of doing it. But, uh, but false accept is usually the worst. You would hate to have someone that's not authorized get into the system. Okay. Crossover error rate is the point in which the number of false rejects equals the number of false acceptance. So that's pretty much what that is. All right. They list a couple different ones up here, you know, um, retina scan, fingerprint, handwriting. Fingerprints, um, 
we have a biometric lock in our building still. We, have, we had three. We have one left that still works. They're getting old. They're almost 10 years old now. It works good, but it takes a while. I mean, sometimes I have to put my finger on there a couple of times. Um, has anyone ever tried the little home use fingerprint scanners you can get for your computer? Yeah. Okay. I bought one APC brand. Very, very, very popular one. It worked good. Put my fingerprint on it, it would work fine. My son one day walks into my office, takes a piece of paper, puts it on it, pushes down on it, and lets him in. Because the fingerprint scanner had a glass. And my fingerprint was on the glass. So when he put the piece of paper on it, he got in. There's a Mythbuster episode about that. And it's oh, yeah. really, really interesting. Now, Microsoft came out with another brand, which actually worked much, much better. I used it for quite a few years. It was like a... Um, it felt like gel you were putting your finger in. It was this really soft plastic, so your fingerprint didn't stay on it. And you could put your fingerprint in any orientation, and it would work. In Oklahoma now, we actually have to use our fingerprint with our driver's license. You all have to do that? You don't? Well, yeah, we do there now. Dr. Schnoy was actually on the committee to redo the Oklahoma driver's license. So it's got all this new security, but, it, yeah, they got to scan a whole bunch of fingers until they finally get one that meets some criteria to put in the system. But. You'd slide your finger over? It slid, slid it over, but you had, it was three fingers. So it wasn't just one. You wow. You had to do a combination of three. So we, to address that problem, if they found something that had your fingerprint on it. Yeah, they'd have to have three. So the, and they, and they, hmm. they uh, you know, recommended using different hands. You know, maybe it was your thumb, thumb, four fingers yeah. going back and forth. Huh. That'd be cool. And if it's wrong, you cut your finger off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stick your finger in the hole. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You ain't getting it out. <laughs> that'd, that'd be funny. But all right. But they have handprint, voice patterns, keystroke, which we just looked at. You know, it's, it's amazing. I mean, that little website, Keystroke Dynamics, that's a cool thing to show your students because you know, it works. It works really well. Yeah. All right. Um, signature recognition, we talked about that. Um, all right, so let's move on. Okay. Managing them, there's, you need some sort of access control policy. Okay. Who's going to get access to what? And, you know, a lot of that, you know, like our organization, you know, once you get hired, like we have in our people's office system, we have a template. When you get a new employee, you put it in, you answer all these questions. And based on their position, they automatically get a certain level of access to the row system. Then whenever you need to be upgraded, it's kind of cool because you're going to put a request and this is, is there anyone else in the organization with similar access rights? That way they could, you know, okay, now I'm not the same as Al, that kind of stuff. So it works really good. All right. All right, firewalls. Is there any device that prevents specific type of information from moving between two networks? Okay, very important. If you have a Linksys router at your house, you have a firewall. Windows has a firewall. Let's see, are these turned on? Let's find out. I'm going to go to the control panel, firewall, and the firewall is on. I'm actually impressed. In my school, they're turned off. <laughs> what the heck? But they said, we have an outside firewall. We don't need an inside firewall. I'm like, yes, you do. Yes, you do. All right. So, okay, so it's a connection between an untrusted outside and the trusted inside. Okay. Could be on a separate computer or could be software built into yours as well. All right. We have packet filtering, which the original ones, which actually most of them still are. Okay. So the simple network basically looks at each packet. It looks at, could be source, could be destination, could be port, could be whatever, and filters based on that type of information. This is bottom. IP address, type of packet, port request, could be anything. Okay. Here's an example. Okay. We are going to, if the source is 1010 and the destination is anywhere, on any port, block it. So we're going to block that pro that uh, private IP address. Also going to block the 192, but we're going to allow the 172 network. Okay, so that's what they're doing there. Okay. Now, if it's coming from anywhere, go into 10.10.10.24, and it's email, let it in. Or if it's web, let it in. If it's anything else, deny it. So I would say this is probably an ACL for incoming mail server and web server traffic, pretty much. So, all right. All right, we also have application-level firewalls. They're a second generation, 
is, is consists of dedicated computers keep separate from the other computers. A lot of times, think of them as proxy servers. Okay, they could filter based on the application. Okay, I showed you yesterday when I brought up that total energy detective at my house on port 20. So is that the proper use of port 20? No, port 20 is FTP. I was using HTTP traffic over port 20. So if they had an application level firewall, they could be looking at that port 20 traffic and say, whoa, 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 this ain't port 20. We're going to block it. But we don't have that in place. Um, uh, I was actually teaching once up at, um, oh, it's a career tech center in Stillwater. It begins with M. Meridian Technologies up in Stillwater. I was teaching an A-plus class. And they have... In my opinion, the most restrictive proxy server firewall system in the world. We were just using internet search something about computers, and all of a sudden the entire lab's internet went down. And within a couple of minutes, someone came to the door and said, what are you all doing on the internet? I told them, like, oh, well, someone typed something that, you know, caused an alarm to go off, and it cut the entire lab off the internet. I'm like, what the heck? It was crazy. But, all right. All right, so application levels is implemented for specific protocols. Maybe I want to only filter HTTP or only FTP or only whatever. Yes? We had an email uh, firewall right. that uh, grabbed, that blocked this one guy's email that was um, always sent to him. His, last, his name was Paul Dykeman. So oh, the email okay. scanner saw his last name as a bad name. Oh, nice. <laughs> that external email. So um, that was kind of funny. I set up a... Uh, for our network lab at Rose State, I wanted to kind of see what the traffic was. So I set up an ISA filter. Uh, ISA is Microsoft's new version of proxy server. Okay? I set up an ISA server, and I saw all this traffic. I couldn't figure out what the heck it was. It was like, what is this traffic? It was 24-7. It, I mean, when classes were not in, they were still going on. I figured out what it was. We had a, uh, a faculty member who, with permission, by the way, Asked to put in SETI at home on the lab computers. I don't know what SETI at home is. SETI is to look for extraterrestrial life. So he installed it on the lab computers. Whenever they weren't busy, it was chomping away on some, some data. So I was like, what is this traffic? It was driving me crazy. It was like Boingo or something the traffic went through. The name of it where it goes was weird. But I don't know. It was, it was kind of crazy, but it was freaking me out. Okay. We also have Stateful. Okay, so keep track of each network connection and use it as a state table. Think of it as a firewall that lists nothing through. But if you make a request for something, that request answer can come in. Okay? So there, that's a lot better. It says track table, it says the state tables track the context of each packet exchange according which was sent, which is where they went, where they're coming back from. So if I make a request to Google, obviously the request from Google can come back in. But if I don't make the request initially, nothing can get in. Okay. It says, can restrict incoming packets by allowing access only to packets that constitute responses from the internal host, just like I said. Okay. If a stateful inspection receives an incoming packet that it cannot match, it drops it. Okay. It could use an ACL at the time or it could drop it. So a lot better than the newer ones. Okay. We also have dynamic generation or dynamic ones, which is the fourth generation. Okay. It says allows only particular packs with specified source destination and ports to pass through. Okay. It says understands how the protocols work. In other words, you shouldn't be able to you know, use them for other stuff. Okay. It says it's an intermediary between applications and packet filters. So it's kind of like a proxy with a regular packet filtering. Okay. All right. So we talked about the implementations. They all kind of work the same, but we could have dual home, which is a system that actually has multiple, you know, inside and outside interfaces. You could actually have more than that. Okay? We're going to talk about it. Okay, packet filtering routers, that's what you guys have here. You have a router with an ACL that filters out packets. Okay? You can be configured to block packets that are not allowed. Okay? Could be used for authentication, auditing, so on and so forth. Okay? Here's our picture of one. We got our trusted network and our untrusted network. Packets try to get in, it blocks it. Okay? We let stuff out, but only certain stuff can come in. Filtered packets can come in. Maybe we're allowing in email traffic only or something like that. Okay? Up in our lab upstairs at Rose State, where the virtual lab is, um, we manage it ourselves. 
and we were when we they gave us the connection they said hey just so you know this is unfiltered traffic you need if you're going to you need to take care of yourself so we do we filter it ourselves so it's basically what we have all right screened hosts is combined a packet filtering with a separate dedicated firewall such as a proxy server okay the router does the screening of it and maybe letting only certain things through okay so maybe the proxy will let HTTP traffic or something like that. You all know what a proxy is? Someone does something on your behalf. Okay. Uh, a good example of that, I used to take care of a company called Taylor Valve Technologies. They made oil well components. Okay. And they, when I first started working for them, they had some really old copy machines. But we got them all upgraded. This is prior to high-speed internet. So we actually had the entire organization working off of a dial-up, one dial-up, okay? But they only went to certain websites. Like they would go to UPS, FedEx, and just really all they did all day long. But what I did was I set up a proxy server for them. So what happened is the clients or the people inside would need information. They'd go ask the proxy server for it. It would go get it. They'd return it to them. If somebody else needs the same information, already had it. So it's like you think about it. Um, MSN used to be a very popular home page for computers. Because you got a Windows machine, you had MSN as your home page. So if I have a thousand machines all running MSN as their home page, they all bring up the browser, what happens? You have a thousand requests to MSN. With a proxy server, the first one goes out and gets it from MSN and stores it. The second and subsequent, you know, 999 people. Ask the proxy server for MSN, it already has it, returns it instantly. So proxy server can definitely cut down on traffic. They can also be used to let search and stuff in and out. Uh, when I was working on CNS certifications years ago, we had to connect to the CNSS website on a specific port. Roast, they blocked that port. But what they did was they set up a proxy server, so if I configured my machine to go through the proxy, it would then allow that one port to go through but everybody else that wasn't using the proxy wasn't allowed to go through. So kind of a nice thing to have. Okay. A bastion host is a single rich target for external attacks. It's a machine that you people are probably going to break into. Okay. But secure it the best you can. Here's our picture here. Again, we have our untrusted network. We have our application firewall. We're letting certain people connect to it. And filter traffic goes to it. So you want to do your best to filter it and secure it, but you need people to still be able to get to it. All right. Dual home, it says a, a host containing at least two network interfaces, normally one on the internal, one on the external side, one secured, one unsecured, and it uses NAT. What NAT is is network address translation. Um, like, you guys don't have it here at your school, but at our school we have private addresses, internal private addresses on all machines. So what happens is, we want to surf the internet. We connect to the gateway. It said, I want Google. So it makes a note. It says, Ken's computer wants Google. So it replaces the source with its address, sends it out to Google. Response comes back to itself. It then looks in its NAT table and says, oh, this request goes to Ken. It then forwards it on to Ken. And that's a great way to go. Um, most places use it, except for you guys. So I just... <laughs> That's fine. So, all right, Nat, very, very, very nice. All right. All right, dual home firewalls. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that's not routable. The, the 10 network, the 192 and the 172 are not routable. They're private addresses. Now, um, okay, so you all know 192.168 is a non-routable address. You all agree with that? It's a private internal address only. Okay. Uh, when I ran my network at home, when I ran my ISP, my internal network was 66.210.163, which was a Class A address from Cox, but it was a routable address. My external address was 192.168. When I first saw that, I'm like, what? It doesn't make sense. How could my external address be a non-routable internal IP address? And the guy at Cox made total sense. He's like, it's external to you, but it's still internal to us. So the 192 address was still internal to Cox. So my traffic went to Cox, which then forwarded it out. Because you always connect through somebody else. So, All right. Here's an example of it. We have a dual home system. Could have multiple interfaces on it. Okay. 
You have a firewall, it could be forming NAT, could be whatever, okay? All right, screen subnets consists of one or more internal bastion hosts located behind a packet firewall. They're each protected somewhat. Okay, you can have filtering routers. You can have some that aren't filtered at all. Let's show a picture of it here in a second. Here we are. We have some servers that are in what's called the demilitarized zone. Was you want to allow web, email, and FTP traffic to these machines? So it hits our firewall, and all that traffic is directed to those servers. Other traffic is sent normally through another firewall to the internal network. Okay. So portions of the machines aren't really filtered that well. Some are. Okay. Questions to ask. What technology do you want to use? The cost. The cost is excessive on some of these. Um, that Chapel Supply Company, I had to set up a hardware-based VPN between Oklahoma City and Fort Worth. I use SonicWall. Anyone ever set up SonicWall? That is the easiest firewall to set up in the world. Could not believe it. Set them up, worked great. Um, prior to that, I mean, way back in late 90s, maybe early 2000s, had a company, a VIP Insurance, out of Oklahoma City. They're an insurance company clearinghouse. Other insurance companies get data from them. Like they have all the data that other insurance buys it from them. They needed a, a VPN set up between Oklahoma City and Edmond, and then another one between Oklahoma City and Dallas. And this is prior to all these nice gooey firewalls, which are easy to do. They hired me to set it up. I charged them 600 bucks to set it up between Oklahoma City and Edmond, Oklahoma. It took me, I don't know, three or four days. Got it all set up. The router's all configured. Again, it was all done via command line. It was speed stream routers at the, at the point, at the time. Got it all set up, great for them. They loved it, worked perfectly. And then they wanted me to connect one from Oklahoma City to Dallas. I said, it'll be another $600. They're like, but, you know, you didn't take that much time. So why are we paying you this amount of money when you didn't really take that much time? In other words, they thought they were overpaying me. I said, fine, do it yourself. So they said, okay, we'll do it ourselves. About a week later, they contacted me. Ken, would you mind setting up a review? We can't get it to work. But what I did is when I configured the first one, I actually made a script to do it. So all I had to do, I went, okay, no problem. It'll be $600. I took my script, changed the name of the destination, hit apply. I was done within a couple hours. You should have charged them $1,200. I should have. <laughs> charged them 600 bucks for the second one. They're like, okay. <laughs> Another funny story of what happened was, uh, you know what QuickBooks is? Obviously, we talked about that. I'm, had an account friend of mine come to me, said one of their clients, their QuickBooks person put a password on the QuickBooks file and quit. Won't give them the password. We need the password. Can you break the password? I said, sure. So it's going to be 150 bucks. Went on the internet, typed in Quis QuickBooks password cracker. Because <laughs> I had the file. So I downloaded this little program, ran it. Two seconds later, had the password. I did wait till the next day to send it to him, though. I can imagine if I said it within five minutes, but yeah, it's, it's well, funny. It is. I said, okay, I'm going to take a little bit of time on this. Yeah. One. They were happy with that, but cost is a big issue with firewalls. Different ones do different things, okay? How easy to configure it? Because you're always changing them, and we're always changing our firewalls, okay? Maintenance, how easy does it get to, how to configure it, what handle what we need? Our firewall row state is 100 megabit. Obviously, it's not big enough, so we're going to have to change it. Future growth is an issue as well. Okay, managing them it says any firewall device must has its own configuration okay. of what it's going to do. That's the ACL normally, the rule set. Okay, should have a policy of what it's to do. Okay, okay, configuring them can be difficult, and I've, I've spent hours sometimes configuring firewalls. You have one little error somewhere, and about drives you crazy. So they can be hard to set up. And that first one, there, the proper, well, I guess the second one, the proper sequence is a big issue with firewalls. The most frequent traffic should normally be at the top, okay? All right, proper sequencing, we just mentioned that, very important. For most resource-intensive actions must be the most, res well, okay, theirs is the most restricted one, but yours, I say, the vSphere should be at the top. That's the thing you use the most, okay? All right, they deal directly with patterns. You can look at them, see what they're doing. You can actually generate logs of what they're catching, all that stuff. So, okay. 
All right, they're fun they work within limits of hardware. So obviously you might have to get a fast one if you get more traffic. I had some old 2500s when I ran my SP at my house. They worked, they did fine. But I found out that when I started adding multiple T1s into the same router, I had an issue. I was bonding them together, so I had to upgrade to 2800s. So still they were, they weren't that expensive. Okay. Best practices, all traffic from the trusted network allowed out. What that means is everything from inside should go out. Does everybody want that? No. But that's a best practice. Normally that would be fine. Okay. It's never accessible from the public network. In other words, you do not want someone to be able to configure it from the outside. SMTP is allowed to pass through okay, to a mail server. That's mail. Okay. ICMP should be denied. We want to block pings because that can be used for denial of service. Okay. So these are, again, these are best practices. Telnet access to internal from the public should be blocked. Telnet to the router from the internal is okay, but from the outside should be blocked. Okay. It says when web servers are authorized, it should be in some sort of DMZ architecture. In other words, allow web traffic to a specific location only. Okay. All right. IDS is a bunch of them out there. Snort's the most popular. There's a bunch of them out there. OSEC is one. Okay. They can be used to detect, prevent issues. Okay. They can, can detect intrusions. They can also prevent intrusions. They can just do all kinds of stuff. Okay. All right. They're by burglar alarms. They should go up and alert you. They should go up and say, hey, we're having such and such a problem. They should send you a text and you do some way of alerting you. Okay. Again, they're complex to configure, but once you get them up and running, they're nice. It says snort is free. It's a decent one to use. Okay. They can respond to detect threats by attempting to prevent it from succeeding. So the new ones can actually do that. Okay. Okay. All right. Some things it can do. It can stop the attack. It can change the security environment. It can also change what they're getting. So they can do a lot of different things. Okay. They can be on a host. They can be on the network. They can be signature based. There's a lot of stuff. I worked on one at Tulsa called a signature based one, which was looking for a specific type of traffic. It just listened in on the network. Look for the traffic and generated logs based on that. Okay. You can also do statistics. Our normal web traffic is, you know, 20% of our traffic. But all of a sudden it jumps up to 80%. There could be something going on. So you could go statistically as well. Okay. Here they are. They're, look, they're examining the header of the packets. Okay. All right. Host base could be on your individual machines. Examples of those are things like Zone Alarm, uh, Trend Micro. Uh, one of my clients I still help out at church ran Trend Micro. Anyone use Trend Micro here? Yeah. It's a good system. But the issue I had with it was in Trend Micro, you could configure it to be very super maximum protection where they block everything, or you could configure it for different environments. Well, this church, I had it configured pretty securely, but I needed them to be able to do email, connect to a domain, surf the web, that kind of stuff. But it kept coming up every now and then. It would say, your system is not configured for maximum protection. Would you like to configure this now? And all you have to do is say yes. And it turns it on. So many times they'd call me and say, Ken, my internet's down. Oh, great. So I figured the whole place is down. No, it's just on one machine. And I go and say, what did you do? I did nothing. Well, another one. Well, I said, look, I said, your system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... I said, but your, your firewall has been reconfigured, your, your IDS. And she's like, well, it told me I wasn't secure. So I had to make it secure by clicking yes. I said, yeah, but the problem is if you make it secure, it's like I'm plugging it. So I, they, I don't know. I don't think they ever actually got that. So what I ended up doing was switching it, got rid of it, went to another system. Because yeah, I, I have a really good system now that I set up for one of my clients. Okay. And it's all like on the cloud. And right. so all of their clients now, right. that they go to there and it's managed through the cloud. So their end users of the right. stack's office, they can't change it. And mm. the other thing that it provides is the URL filtering right. categories. And oh, stuff. wow. I, mean, it's, I like it a lot. Better. What's it called? It's, it's trans. I, can't, I was trying to look for it real quick because I can't remember exactly. But it's instead of the individual products that they have right. for small business or home use, right. it's all managed through there. And you just set up the PCs huh. that you want. You just order X number of licenses. Licenses. Wow, that might be nice. It's, it's, it's a lot more streamlined. Well, that'd be cool. 
Guys are so tired. I mean, it probably happened half a dozen times. Yeah. Finally said, you know, I can't. And if there's a problem, then it emails me, you know, like if they're getting too many hits right. or something, I can call them and say, did you know this or did you know this was going on? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, very nice. All right. All right. So it says, unless they're very precisely configured, benign actions can generate a large amount of false alarms. That's the tough part. Okay. You don't want all those false alarms because false alarms are bad. It's like the, the, the boy who cried wolf. If you keep getting false alarms, sooner or later you can start ignoring them. Okay? All right. But they can monitor multiple computers. They can do all kinds of stuff. Okay? I also have network base, which are on your network. They're normally listening in on the traffic. They can notify administrators, look for passions of, you know, uh, patterns of traffic. Okay? They, they said they match known and unknown attack strategies based on our knowledge. But in other words, they're looking at signatures and, you know, current, you know, usage pattern kind of thing, if you can think of. So, okay. But it has more false positives because it's looking at all the traffic on the network rather than the individual host. Okay. The signature base, kind of what I just mentioned, they're looking just for specific signatures. Weaknesses, though, if the signature is something new, it's not going to get it. If attacks are slow and method, uh, method, methodical, wow, can't say that. They can slip undetected, and their actions may not match the signatures and might get through. A good thing about that could be a VPN. VPN traffic could actually let viruses get in because they're getting through the firewalls, so it could actually cause issues. Like I connect to row state to the VPN all the time to get into the internal network. Now, if I was infected with a virus, the virus could theoretically get into the row state network because now I'm on the network and I'm bypassing the firewall because I'm sending encrypted data into their network. So I don't know how their concentrator is configured. Now, if their concentrator is configured, virus checking them were okay. I just don't know how they figured that. Yes. One thing, uh, uh, the run low and slow, what we found is uh, a few years ago, about three years ago, when we had a lot of problems with advanced persistent threat, right. they would run low and slow. Right. It would take us a long time to detect them. Right. But over a year, over the past few years, our detection has gotten better. So now, in my opinion, every time we catch them, they bum rush us. They, like, know they're going to be detected quickly. So, they do a whole bunch real quick. So they, like, grab. I mean, they do the opposite. <laughs> yeah. I mean, bandwidth goes through the roof. They bum rush us because it takes a certain amount of time for the cyber security technician to respond right. to the alert. You know, like, last time it happened, it was, like, 23 minutes. Well, in those 23 minutes, he was grabbing stuff. Yeah. It was like a, sna a, a smash and grab. Right. I mean, he wasn't trying to be quiet at all. Yeah. It was like the Katrina, Katrina when everybody was stealing everything. Yeah, I mean, he was just grabbing everything. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and it's called uh, Worry-Free Business Security Services. Wor and it's got 24-7 updates. I'm, I'm going to move to it at home. I really like it. Worry-Free... Business. business security services, but, and it's, it's trend micro, hmm. but if you look under for business, but I mean, I, because of all the filtering and stuff, and can't help manage it. I'm going to have to look into that. that. So that might be nice. Because yeah. it's tough, you know, these people, and when you have to configure it on each PC, it gets tough, and you can't centralize management, so. All right, well, cool, I'll have to look into that. All right, statistical anomaly based are looking for stuff that's outside of the norm. Okay, they sample the network, then they compare it with the baseline, see if something's happening. Is there a lot of X Y Z traffic out there? Okay, then they can notify notify the administrator. Administrator advantage is able to detect new types of attacks because it's different, which is what's nice. It's not like a signature base where it's looking for known types. Basically, this is looking for something it doesn't know about. Hey, you know, I normally see mail and web. Now I'm seeing mail, web, and FTP. Where's this FTP coming from? That kind of stuff. Okay. All right. Managing them. If there's no response, then the alert alarm does no good. So if no one looks at it, what good is it? Uh, when I moved into the networking shop at Tinker, um, they had a web server that ran the internal website. Well, a few months after I got there, the website crashed. I mean, the server died. They lost everything. I says, we didn't have any RAID running on that? And they're like, oh, yeah, we do. And I'm like, then why did it crash? Well, what it had done was one of the drives failed years ago. <laughs> they, never, they never did anything about it. I says, I said, you have it. If one fills, you're good. 
Then I says, there was no notification. Well, there's a red light on all the time. So yeah, that's a notification. You got a failure. Yeah, our uh, SAN at our school for the virtual lab, we've lost two drives already. We get the notification. We call Dell. We get the new drive in. And we're done. It takes no time at all. Yeah, when I get hired at Customs, I get to the Atlanta airport. Yeah. And I go in the server room, and there's three servers there, and two out of the three servers have red lights on the drives. So nice. Like, what are those? I was like, I have no idea. They've been there forever. <laughs> <laughs> they were my own drives. The only thing. My first task was oh, to get their Fix the drive. <laughs> when I ran my business, the only thing which, you know, I had servers that had dual redundant power supplies and all this, but you know, I was paying for all this, so I actually a lot of times wouldn't put up the redundant power supplies because it took up extra electricity. But you're right, though. If you don't look at those alerts, what good are they? Okay. It says, must be configured to differentiate between routine. Low, meter, and high security threat. So, hey, you need to take care of this right away. Okay? All right. So, all right, let's move on. So, a poorly configured IDS may yield only noise. Okay? Uh, I, I showed you my alarm system in my house, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of nice because uh, last night I was sitting there at the hotel. And I told you how I configured for the back door if it's left open. It drives me crazy in the summertime. It's like, why am I cooling off the outside? Last night, I was sitting here in the hotel. Notification, back door's open. <laughs> Taking slate, 10 seconds later, back door's closed now. I'm like, good. <laughs> so, I, I mean, it might be annoying, but it's, hey, at least it notifies me. So, it notifies people at the house so they know, oh, I left the door open. I need to shut the darn thing. But I could actually set it to notifying everything. Back in the day, the pagers. Yes. <laughs> My alarm system didn't seem to get paid when it was turned on and turned off. Right. Kids all had separate codes. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. But, you know. Back in the day. Back in the day. That just happened now. Um, but the point is, like, in my system, I could actually have it alert me anytime any door was open, any window was open. What I do like about mine, when I open, like, my windows, it tells me. It, it doesn't notify me, but there's an, it's, the, the system itself says back door or, you know, whatever. It tells me what device was open so I can hear it. But if I could have just imagine if I had it send me a text, anything, any door was open or any window, no. That would be way too much information. All right, they use agents. Agents are software that are usually installed on a system. Could be on a server, could be on a client, could be on somewhere which connect to the IDS, okay? Okay, and a lot of times they're consolidated. Uh, one way I used to use the Tinker when I was there was a HP OpenView. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that one. It was a big consolidated system. It was good. It's probably better ones now. I don't know. It's been years, okay? All right, uh, remote access protection, war dialers. That's when uh, the movie War Games with a Whopper. Y'all remember yeah, War yeah. Games? You haven't seen that? That's a requirement to be in this field. I think we need to start listing that stuff as like prerequisites to get into this program. But that can happen. Um, when I was at Tulsa, we were actually tasked with doing a penetration test on the Health Sciences Center in downtown Oklahoma City. And since I lived in Oklahoma City, I had a house there. I just commuted on weekends. Uh, they tasked me with doing a war dialing on the, on the hospital to look for vo rogue modems. Man, I'd never actually done one, but I was ready. I was all excited. Got to the day we were going to do it, and they canceled it. They said, the problem is there's patient rooms on that phone bank, and they didn't want us dialing every patient room. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Anyone there? You know, so basically they said, no, no, that'll interfere with too many people. My like, darn it. That would have been fun. <laughs> but, all right. Network connectivity using dial-up can be an issue. Very few people are using that now, but... It can be an is issue, okay? Usually when the people use dial-up, they have to log in, so there's good authentication. But it's usually slower, so they can't do as much damage, okay? Radius allows us to support dial-up. So there's remote authentication dial-in user service. When I worked at that ISP, we had a Radius server, and it was, it was awesome. We had a lot of dial-up clients. We had clients who wouldn't pay their bills. What they would do is when they would sign up for service with us, they would give us a bogus phone number. 
So they pay a couple months and they stop paying. So we try to call them, we can't get a hold of them. The cool thing was, since it was dial-up, they had to call into the radio server to get on. I go into the radio server, see what number they're dialing in from. <laughs> then if I want to talk to them, very simple. Disconnect their session, then immediately call their number. Because the motor would hang up, and then I dial in, and they're like, hello? I said, yeah, this is Ken. You're not paying your bill. So <laughs> it was kind of handy for doing that. So, All right. So it says remote authentication server re receives a request, then it authenticates them through a server. Okay, there's also terminal access control access system control si that that name always kills me. Terminal access control access control system. Doesn't it sound kind of redundant? Maybe terminal access control system or something would be better, but it's similar. Or it's on client server basis. Okay. They they dial in, it checks now it doesn't have to be dial in, you can actually use radius against VPNs. You can use Redis against all kinds of stuff. Okay. Managing dial-up, managing dial-up says how many dial-up connections are allowed? Are there authorized modems? At Rose State, they've found rogue access points around the campus before. They found one in the engineering building. Just some student brought it in, plugged it in. So, you know, kind of, kind of different. All right. Um, you should have authorized modem numbers. We used to actually have dial-up in our lab. We did it so we could show students how it worked, but don't anymore. Use callback when available. What that is, you dial in, then the system says, what's your phone number? Then you call back at that number. You can also use token. Wireless protection. That's a, a big area. So what do you all use for wireless encryption nowadays? WPA2? Yeah. Well, yeah, WPA2 is probably the best right now. WEP, W-E-P, which is Wired Equivalency Protocol, I think they're down to the point where they can break that in four seconds now. So it's just amazing how quick that stuff works. But um, WEP, Wired Equivalency Protocol, was originally designed to give wireless networks the same security as wired networks, hence the wired equivalency. It doesn't. Okay? All right. We're driving this, driving around, looking for access points. I have done that in my neighborhood before. So I like my iPhone. I can sit there and just detect networks all over the place. It used to be I'd find so many unsecure ones, but it is different now where most people are securing their wireless in one aspect or another. So there's WEP, there's WPA, which is the better one. Uh, I work for a gym. I actually still take care of a computer system at a gym. They got a, a bike in. Uh, the bike actually connected to a network and you could ride against people. You could actually ride against Lance Armstrong. They had his profile in there and you could race him. Well, when they got the system put in, had to have a special wire router special wireless router that you had to buy from them to connect this bike and all this other stuff. All it was was a system with WPA2 with a token on it. And it's like, what the heck? It was, it was a, the, the bikes actually had a Windows XP system in them. So it was one of those deals, you know, if you hold the steering wheel to the left, hit menu three times, then a special menu popped up where you could configure the bike. But, yeah, I was... It's funny because they, they bought the first system, they bought the router from them, bought everything. Then I looked at it, I'm like, that's nothing special. So from that point on, we bought the routers ourselves. So, WEP was supposed to be great. Turns out it's not anymore. But it did its job initially. It's kind of like the Caesar Cipher. When that came out, that was the best encryption known to man. Nowadays, it's nothing. Okay. WPA is industry standard now. WPA2 is the current version. Okay. It's newer, more robust, uses AES. AES is the advanced encryption standard, which is the best one on the market right now. I mentioned somewhere one day about AES, how it can be used to secure top secret data. At the end of that conference, I was asked not to ever mention that again. What? This is just, no one's supposed to know that. I'm like, whatever. Well, it, they, it, it is, but it's at a hardware encryption level. Right. You can't yeah. do it. At, uh, you have to do it at like level one of the encryption, right. you know, of the, at the media level, you can't do it in that software encryption. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> but I actually teach AES in my class. I actually have the students write a AES application in Java, so it's not that difficult. WiMAX is wireless man or wireless metropolitan area network is um, basically before long, we're all going to be on a wireless network. My house, uh, I know I showed you a picture of my house, I kind of live on the side of a hill. In the bottom of the hill, there's this huge wireless antenna that actually for years before I got Cox, I was using them. 
I actually had wireless access from them. It was much faster than DSL. It was excellent. But before long, they're saying we're all going to have wireless worldwide. Was it? There was an article just this last week about Africa. They're saying, was it by 2020, they want to have 70 or 80% of Africa to have wireless Internet access? You ever look how big Africa is? I don't know how they're going to do it, but before long, it's going to be wireless everywhere. Well, you know, they're trying to create these uh, mesh yeah. wireless networks so that, like, your device acts as a mesh. So if you're carrying your, wire, your phone around... It's actually helping other people, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then it'll help host other people, and so that's how they think they're going to get that coverage. Ah, uh, okay. You know, yeah, but they're talking about the entire continent. That's huge. Yes, that's that's yeah. like... Uh, it, was, it was a news article on Google, like, one day this week. Okay. Bluetooth. Connections up to 30 feet. It's used a lot in cars. My, my MacBook, I use a Bluetooth keyboard with it. Works decent. Um, I don't particularly like the way it works with, like, those Bluetooth headsets people use. I just don't think they're clear enough. But there are problems with it. Your system has to be discoverable. Like, my phone connects in my car. I just... I just don't think it's clearer using it that way. Doesn't authenticate. Once you're in, you're in. You all know that a Wii actually connects via Bluetooth? Yeah. You can connect your Wii to your computer via a little Bluetooth adapter. Okay. Manning Wireless. Set up WPA, WPA2 with shared keys. Probably your best bet. Okay. Uh, scanning analysis tools. There's a lot of them out there. Okay. We're just about done with this chapter. Says administrators may use hackers' tools to examine their own defenses. That's what I tell our school. Hey, you know what? I use these hacking tools, but I don't use it to break in anything. I use them to teach them so we can check stuff. Okay? A lot of scanning tools out there. We looked at Nessus, you know, yesterday, or actually this morning. Okay? There's footprinting tools, there's fingerprinting tools to determine information about the network. There's lots of stuff out there. Port scanners, uh, um, uh, what's the one I'm thinking of? Uh, Nmap, there, I couldn't think of the name of it. There's Nmap out there. It's probably the most popular one out there. You can scan ports. Like, we used, actually, we used the uh, <coughs> GRC this morning. That's actually a port scanner as well. Okay. You can scan specific ports. You can scan all of them. You can do whatever. Okay. Here's some of the common ones. Um, I was actually setting up wireless networks for Buffalo Wild Wings. Some of you have probably heard of them before. I was hired to do their wireless at multiple locations. And you know, I was tasked with setting up wireless that was secure but open. So if I'm going to set up an open wireless network that's somewhat secure, which protocols would you allow? What do you think? H HTTP. HTTP, 80. But is that it? 443, because people might want to connect to a secure website. Is that it? That's what I did initially. Didn't work. Oh, 53. 53. You need to be able to do DNS requests or else you ain't getting nowhere. I initially set up, like, what the heck? And that's UDP and TCP. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. And you de yeah. So 80, 443 is web browsing. But you need 53 if you want to do DNS requests. And the way I figured out that's what it was, I typed in an IP address and I got to it no problem. I said, ah, oh, that's what it is. So. Yeah, I took care of their systems. They would pay me each location that I took care of. would pay me 50 bucks a month. I think in three years I made one service call. So I finally stopped billing them. I felt guilty. I says, man, you guys will never call me. So they were, I mean, it worked. I mean, with just a Linksys router configured, I told them there's never a problem. Unplug it, plug it back in. Never had an issue with it. So it's, yeah. All right, vulnerability scanners. Nessus is one we used earlier today, which works good. Packet sniffers, that could be um, Wireshark. That's a very well-known one. Okay. Content filters, there's a bunch of them out there as well. I don't have anything to name one off the hand. It's kind of like our proxy filters. Trap and Trace, it says, um, growing in popularity, it describes software design to entice individuals are illegally pursuing the internet and then trace them. Um, honeypot kind of thing. Honeypot. You make a machine that looks vulnerable and got all this information, yet it's piece, there's nothing there. It's fake. That's what we're talking about there. 
All right, managing them. It says the manager must be able to see the organization systems and networks from the viewpoint of potential attackers. Okay. You need to test your own system. Do penetration testings. I'm assuming you guys do that or you hire people to do that. Do. Yeah. So it's important you do all that stuff because, trust me, other people are trying to break in. Okay. Drawbacks. It says tools do have human level capabilities. Most tools function in pattern recognition. So you have to know how to use them, you have to keep them updated. And sometimes the tools are detected as bone bows themselves. Okay. It says some universities have policies or laws that protect the individual's rights to access content, like ours. You can watch porn as long as it doesn't bother anybody. So. All right. And tool usage must be work with the existing policy. That's another issue. John the Ripper, I told you, kept getting deleted off my machine. The stupid domain policy they implemented kept deleting it. Oh, crap. So. Encryption jumbles up stuff. That's AES. That's DES. That's whatever you're using. Okay. Cryptography is the science of encryption. Okay. This this road doesn't go in depth on it. Cryptography is the process involved in encoding and decoding, and analysis is analyzing that. Okay. Deciphering the original from what you have. Okay. Algorithms are what's used to encrypt. Could be AES. Could be DES. Could be the Caesar cipher. Could be the Veneer cipher. Could be whatever. The cipher the components involved in it, and the cipher text is what's encrypted. That's the gibberish you get at the end. All right, and crypto systems is the basically the system used to convert information, decipher is the decrypt, and cipher is encrypt. Okay, and the key is what you encrypt something with. Okay? I don't know why I mentioned it here, but. Key space is the entire values. We looked at something earlier today with passwords. We were saying, you know, one digit, two digit, however many digit. The key space is how many possibilities are there. Could be quite large with large key spaces. Okay. Plain text is what you start with. Steganography is hiding something in, inside of something else. It's most widely known for encrypting something and hiding inside of a picture. I do projects in that. Work factor is the amount of effort it takes to solve stuff. Man, how many slides are on this chapter? I think I thought we were almost done with it. 130 something? Yep. <laughs> wow. All right. We're going to finish it. We're going to. Encryption, okay. Common ciphers. Monoalphabetic uses one alphabet. Polyalphabetic uses two. Okay, I'm barely covering this stuff, but I told Dr. Snow we should probably include a encryption course for CSEC, but. I think it would be too much involved to have everybody start taking another course. Because I teach computer security. I teach, what I did is I took his computer security course, brought it down to a, um, a lower level. I teach it's awesome. Everybody loves it. This, I would say between that and forensics are the two most favorite classes of our whole entire degree program. Which one? Computer security and forensics. Because in computer security, I teach everything from Caesar cipher to the veneer cipher all the way up to AES. And I actually show them how they work. And I have a lot of students who go to Tulsa, and it's great because it's kind of like a, a very good preparatory course where Dr. Schnoy might cover AES in five minutes. I cover it in two weeks. So, you know, they understand it better. So I think someday we should start off from those, but who knows. Okay. Transposition ciphers, it's basically moving stuff around, rearranging stuff. XOR, if you don't know what XOR is, it's basically one or the other but not both. I actually have a assignment about this stuff, which y'all come to the next class. We'll probably do it in the next class. I'll show it to you. I have a couple other assignments that I brought. I even brought an assignment about IPv6 and stuff like that that y'all see. I'll show you to you. Here's XOR. One or the other, but not both. So 0 and 0 is 0. 0 and 1 is 1. 1 and 0 is 1. 1 and 1 is 0. So 1 or the other, but not both. It's used in encryption. It's used extensively in AES. It's actually used in quite a bit of stuff. Okay, the Vernum cipher was used by AT&T, and I'm not going to go into these in great depth. Okay, running key, it's a key that's continuing, like maybe out of a book or something. Symmetric encryption, the encryption and decryption key are the same. AES would be considered a symmetric encryption system. Okay. All right, uh, methods are usually extremely efficient. They can do large amounts of data very quickly. Okay. Talk about sending keys. We're not going to go. Des made in '77. Um, I don't remember when it was finally 
what year did they break? It probably says in here. I can't remember. 1997, okay? They offered a $10,000 reward for the first team to be able to crack it. It has been broken, by the way. Triple Dez, you would think it's Dez three times, but it's not. It's actually encrypted with one key, decrypted with a second key, encrypted with the first key again. So it actually gives you, and it's actually still used today. A lot of firewalls still use Triple Dez. Okay. AS is the most popular one. AS was developed doing an open competition. Actually, uh, Dez, real quick, go back to that one. Um, Dez was based off of the Lucifer cipher. Okay. So why do you think it was called the Lucifer cipher? Well, it was based off of the D-E-M-O-N algorithm. What's D-E-M-O-N? Daemon like the devil. Daemon was short for demonstration. The application couldn't handle that many letters, so they just shortened demonstration to demon, which then became Lucifer. So it's like, what the heck? So he says, oh, yeah, it's based on the devil. Because the demon, no, that was a demonstration yeah, algorithm. So it's funny. But AES was an open competition and works great. They're saying the same, the same computer, this is 1998, computer designed to, uh, would take 56 hours to crack DES, would take uh, 4.6 4 quadrillion years to crack AES. Now, my point on that is, that might be the average, but could you possibly guess it the first time? Yeah. Sure. Sure you could. Um, Rain Man, prime example of that. There was also a movie called, with Bruce Willis called Mercury Rising. Another really good movie to watch. It's got a kid. I guess there's a, a word search magazine out there. It's not word search, but it's a magazine. And the kid looks at the magazine and reads a code in it and calls this number. And they're like, how did you get this number? And he's like, it was in the magazine. And that starts off a big deal that no one was ever supposed to be able to break that code. It's a pretty good movie called Mercury Rising with Bruce Willis. Okay. Asymmetric. Encryption and decryption are different. Okay. Not as quick, but it's actually pretty good. We're actually going to cover PGP in the next class, so I'll go more in depth on that. Okay. Normally I cover it in both, but since we're, there's no sense in covering it twice. Uh, PGP is great. I have a key. I'll actually show you where my key is. So if you ever want to encrypt someone with PGP, make sure I'm the only one who gets it. Go to keystore.pgp.com. Spell it correctly. What the? Oh, I was key server. I'm sorry. Keyserver.pgp.com. There it is. Keyserver.pgp.com. KDUI at rose.edu. Let's search for KDUI and type in this. Uh, What's this thing called? Anyone know what that's called on the screen right there? Pain in the butt. It's called CAPTCHA. C-A-P-T-I-A. It's prevent automated systems from doing it. There's Ken Dewey's key right there. You can download it right there. Let's open this up. And let's select a program. And we will open it up with Notepad's good enough. Format, word wrap. There's my key. If you encrypt something with this key and send it to me, I'm the only one in the world that can open it. So my key is public knowledge to the world. Okay. Hence, public key repository. Digital signatures, we're not encrypting the message. What we're doing is we're calculating a value based on it. And then we should be able to calculate using the same algorithm every time and get the same value. Okay. Certificates, those are what's used to like secure our websites, that kind of stuff. We talked about that at the beginning of the class. Certificate authorities manage those certificates for us. It's kind of funny because I used to have host a lot of secure websites and I had to get certificates. And years back, I would go get a certificate for a company, and they're supposed to really authenticate who you are before they give you a certificate. But I remember I'd, I'd submit the request for... Like I did one for the First Marine Division Association. Requested their certificate. I get an email back that says, more information is needed. Please get all this information, you know, incorporation papers and all this stuff and send it to us. So I'm like, great. So I contact the First Marine Division. 
And I go, all right, we're going to get it together. It'll be a few days. The next day I get an email, congratulations, your request has been approved. Here you go. I'm like, I ain't sent you nothing yet. <laughs> so I got the point back then that ah, they would always ask for it. I guess they assumed you were just going to send it. You didn't need to. In a couple of days they would always approve you. So it doesn't work quite that easy anymore. All right. PKI is an entire set of hardware system personnel and policies used to encrypt stuff. You can use PKI on your computer system. Okay. Provides authentication, integrity, confidentiality, authorization. Provides all that stuff we like. Also something different we haven't talked about yet called non-repudiation. It basically, you cannot tell me it wasn't you. I know you did this because of whatever. Okay? All right. Here's a certificate by Amazon.com. Yay. Okay. We have a hybrid system, which is kind of the boat. They might use the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange Protocol, which is actually quite simple, but it actually works. There's another book by Stephen Levy called Crypto, C-R-Y-P-T-O. Again, you can buy it for five bucks. It's called Crypto, which goes into great detail about all these. It puts the encryption world into story format. It tells you how Diffie-Hellman came up with his protocol, how they started to work on it, and how they got it to work, and how no one believed them it was that simple. It's really, really, really interesting. So it's so called Crypto, C-R-Y-P-T-O by Stephen Levy. All right. So there's other one, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. We talked about that already, but there's other ways of doing it. Modern systems, key management is an issue. With a symmetric system like AES, we have to share a key. How do I get the key to you? Well, and how do we manage the key? That's an issue. Okay, we're not, okay, not going to go in depth on them. Okay. Norman cryptography gives us authentication, gives us confidentiality, integrity, gives us a bunch of stuff. Okay. Well, for email, we have SMIME, but I don't know anyone that actually uses it, but there is secure email out there. There's also privacy-enhanced email. It's, I don't know anyone at all that's ever used that. Okay. PGP, that's the thing I logged in earlier, developed by Phil Zimmerman. And yeah, if you go read that book, Crypto, the, the big old deal about PGP, how the government basically gave them a cease and desist order, says do not continue with this, do not give anybody any information about it. And all he did is he posted on one website, said please distribute. <laughs> and it was done at that point. Basically the government came back and said fine, it's too late now, the whole world knows about it. But to this day, PGP is unbreakable, pretty much. Yeah. All right, works good. IPsec is IP security, used in VPNs a lot. Uh, again, we're not going into depth on them, but two components, a security protocol and also a key exchange protocol. So we have to be able to get the key back and forth, make sure it works. Of course, it works in a couple different modes, transport and tunnel. Transport, think of transport like I got a truck. I know it's going from point A to point B. But I don't know what's in it. That's transport mode. Okay, Only the data is encrypted. I know where it came from. I know where it's going to, but I don't know what's in it. Tunnel mode, I don't have a clue. I know there's traffic. I don't know how much. I don't know what it is. I don't know who sent it. Nothing. I just can't even see it. Entire packet is encrypted and stored in the payload of another packet. Okay, So if I have a VPN set up between... Oklahoma City and Fort Worth, all I know is there's traffic between Oklahoma City and Fort Worth. I don't know which computer on either end. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know who they're talking to. It's often used in VPNs. Okay. Set, security electronic transactions. I used to cover that in great gory depth inside of my security commerce course. Not really used anymore. So it was developed by MassCard and Visa. No one really liked it. SSL is what we all use now. Uses RSA mainly for key transfer. Okay, use triple DES, actually can use AES too. Okay. All right, SSH, that's our secure websites, which actually uses SSL. Okay. And secure shell, which is SSH, use, it's like the secure version of Telnet. Okay. Oh, you're right, there's 130 slides in this chapter, wow. All right, all right. Um, so says crypticism provide enhance and secure communications. Kerberos is what we actually use for our domain logins. Okay. It's a database of private keys, and our systems use that to connect in. When our private keys are authenticated, one's a node. Basically, it has a 
ticket granting servers and key exchange protocols that allows us to talk on our network. Okay. Follows that whole thing, just three headed dog. Yes. Maybe, so. Yeah. That's where it came from. Yeah. That's. But not the demon demonstration algorithm. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, managing them. Don't lose your keys. Don't know, know who you're communicating with. That's not always easy. Is it legal to use a specific encryption technique when communicating to some nations? Remember when our old browsers, you couldn't download a specific encryption level and send it outside the United States? Yeah. All right. Every system has a weakness. It's usually the person. Okay. Even if I'm using AES, if I if my key gets out there, what good is it? Okay. All right, let's move on. There's no security and obscurity. Okay, security protocols are still configured by humans. It means you could screw it up very easily. Okay, we finally finished the chapter. Yay! All right, let me stop this.